Hey, this is Blind Man Bert, and today I'm demonstrating a Digital at Nexus 4 uh, FPGA development board that I'm putting up for sale on eBay. This is to show uh, that the board is in working order since it's being sold in pre-owned used condition, and also to document some of the features of the board and to describe the PMOD accessories that are being sold with it. First of all, regarding the board itself, this is a product from Digital Int Inc. here in the United States. Uh, it's commonly purchased by professional uh, FPGA developers, students, and also folks who just want to learn about uh, Xilinx FPGA development. It features an Artix A7 100T, 100T um, FPGA which is an interesting choice because that actually means that this can be programmed both using the newer Xilinx Vivado suite as well as the older um, Xilinx ISE suite. And we'll see some of the demos that I'll be putting on a CD to ship with this are implemented in one in either ISE or Nexus or, or uh, Vivado or sometimes both. Um, and um, there are four PMOD connectors. Well, let me, let's actually start with the, the simple GPIO things. There are 16 uh, user slide switches, an eight segment, uh, sorry, an eight digit seven segment onboard uh, L LED display. There are five buttons in the up, left, center, right, and down configuration. There is a reset button which is inverted logic that, that is simply a GPIO PIO pin and there's also a programming reset button which causes the FPGA to reload uh, from flash or SDRAM memory. So you tend to, tend, if you want to reset your program you'll typically press this, uh, your, if you want to reset your FPGA uh, patch you'll typically want to hit this reset button. If you want to reload the, the program, then you'll hit this button here. What else do we have? We have four PMOD, digital PMOD connectors here, and that uh, we'll see, we'll explore what the four PMOD accessories that are bundled with this thing are in the process of uh, this video. There is a, uh, a JXDC connector here, which I'm less familiar with, but I believe is for uh, inputting and outputting um, analog signals directly to the chip. Note that this um, Nexus 4 device is the original version of the device sold by Digilent, which, which uh, contains a cellular RAM chip. It is not a Nexus 4 DDR board. So this was purchased in 2004, October 2014, while the Nexus 4 original uh, CRAM based boards were being sold. What happened was the um, the manufacturer of the CRAM discontinued the line and uh, Digilent kept making these boards as long as they had a stock but then redesigned the board around a, D a DDR. I should say that the CRAM is a less uh, useful device for a couple of reasons. One is you need to build a custom controller which I've partially done to get uh, data on and off the RAM. The second thing is, is there's no built-in Vivado CRAM controller, so you can't simply roll out a DDR2 or DDR3 controller and make this work. So this is this is uh, the main difference. I think it might be the only difference between the Nexus 4 DDR and the Nexus 4 original CRAM boards is the memory. So this is a slightly less useful board than a DDR board and the price of $170 will reflect that um, and uh, uh, unless you want to match an existing board that you have them that uh, must be CRAM based. What else do we have? Uh, one of the things I really like is uh, this doesn't this board doesn't support directly uh, HDMI ins or outs. HDMI is actually kind of tricky and hard to support on FPGAs uh, I've yet to build a patch that successfully produces HDMI on my Spartan 6 board, which has lots of uh, H, uh, my Atlas board, which has lots of uh, HDMI ins and outs. It's actually relatively easy to develop VGA, and I'll include a couple of patches, both the um, 
Nexus 4 demo patch by Digilent and also the uh, some programs of some patches of my own design which produce um, VGA video. What else do we have? An Ethernet connector I've never used. We have a USB host port here. We have uh, power, which I'll talk about in a second. We have a programming and UART port here, which is in micro USB uh, format. Um, I think that's called micro B. So uh, included in the sale will be a USB A to micro USB adapter. So you can program directly. Um, there is an onboard microphone. There are other sensors such as a temperature sensor, an accelerometer, and I forget what else. This will be uh, described more fully. Let's talk about a couple of things. We'll first talk about static and then we'll talk about power. You'll notice that I'm um, accessing this board or touching this board using a properly grounded wrist strap on an anti-static mat. It's very important that you take static discharge into account. You don't want to directly touch any of the metal pins on this without being properly static grounded. It's, it's okay to use the slide switches or to touch the display or the buttons. Actually, I wouldn't even touch the buttons here because uh, you'll notice there's metal around them. Uh, you might, you might uh, if you're not properly grounded, you might discharge through that. That violates my warranty. I'm only warranting um, that this device will work for you on arrival, so you want to confirm that the power on demo mode works correctly, but any static discharge on the customer side I can't warrant against for the 30-day warranty period. So I just want to make that clear. Definitely make use of the static mat. Properly uh, apply a, a wrist strap to yourself so nothing funny will go on. Let's next talk about power. There is a power uh, configuration jumper right here, which will ship in the wall setting. Let me zoom in a bit uh, since it's a since this camera is a little tricky to focus. Uh, maybe that's a little too far in. Um, this jumper here will be shipping in the wall setting, which means you need to use the included uh, power adapter uh, plugged into a wall plug. Um, there is a sliding adapter here. If you pinch these two plastic pieces inward, I can't do this while I'm holding the camera, that will allow this part to slide off. This is a little thing here which slides off that has the US connector. If you want to convert to 220 to 240 volt operation, there's a sliding piece here that you would just switch for uh, European operation. The switching power supply itself um, will operate anywhere between um, on from power anywhere between 100 to 240 volts and within a certain uh, frequency range and is guaranteed to produce a pretty solid 5 volt output. So the switching power supply is included in the sale as well as both US and European power adapters. So with this set in the wall setting, flipping this switch will turn the unit on. If this is set to the other side, it will power from the USB uh, connection, the programming connection. Um, and a third setting would be to remove the jumper and then you would have two pins, uh, the middle pin on the top and the bottom pin on the bottom to which you could power, you could supply an external battery to run the FPGA on battery or breadboard power. Uh, finally, uh, the other jumper settings I want to talk about has to do with where the uh, program will be loaded from. This jumper here and this jumper here work in conjunction. Uh, you can check the uh, Digilent documentation which will be included on a, a CD that will be sent with this device. Uh, that uh, The CD is an ISO format CD uh, that will run on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, the jumper here will be shipped in the Oh, what is this? This says QSPI setting. This is jumper number... Uh, I, my eyes are actually not good. This is probably jumper number one. So the power jumper is jumper number three. Jumper number one will be set to QSPI. Jumper number two will be set to USB. What this means is at power up, it will load the patch from the flash memory and then uh, can be programmed from the USB port. 
Alternatively, the other mode that I sometimes run this in is to flip this one over to the right side, in which case it's looking for USB or SD input. And then this uh, jumper over here, I slide over to the SD side. And what that allows you to do is, instead of using the flash memory, you can attach a small, oftentimes I would put in a small 8 gigabyte uh, or, or smaller um, micro SD card into the slot right here and then you load a single bit file and the uh, and the bootloader loads from that instead. Um, I tend not to mess with the flash memory and so actually there have been very few writes to the flash memory on this device. The uh, the digital demo has been written on this flash for the last several years and there are guaranteed to be less than about 200 writes to the to the flash memory uh, which doesn't which doesn't really count much towards it's the lifetime of the flash so I think we're ready to actually turn on the um, to the device after now 12 minutes of discussion <coughs> so let's see uh, let's see what happens at power up we see a power light here after the patch loads, we'll see zero briefly, then pass. That means the CRAM memory has passed. And now it enters a mode where it is cycling the RGB LEDs. All of the switches are off, but if we start throwing switches, we'll see that with each switch thrown, we'll get the corresponding LED lighting up. So you can see here that all of the switches work correctly. Uh, each one affects an LED. I've noticed that some of the switches, and this has happened since day one, occasionally stick. This is not due to wear on this uh, specific unit. It's, this uh, has always done this, and uh, that's just the nature of the switches. So a tip is when that occurs, what you want to do is you want to kind of press, you can kind of see it occurring here. You want to kind of press down on the switch and slide it back and forth a few times and that seems to get the spring or the the slider or whatever it is that goes a little out of whack back in proper orient, uh, proper working mode. So that's not a defect per se of this board in particular. I think it's a manufacturing defect of the switches themselves. Um, and if it occurs, all you need to do, like I say, is slide the uh, switch back and forth. If any, if you can't get any switch to work or any other thing to work, obviously, then that that warrants uh, return of the board for my evaluation. The, um, the, 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 the unit is also producing video at this point, which is unfortunately a little too bright for my camera here. So if you plug in a VGA monitor that's capable of 1024 by 768 or 1280 by 1024, whatever this video resolution is, then you should be able to see this output. It's basically showing that the video, the FPGA itself is working. You can see the, uh, my voice is being picked up by the microphone here. It's showing the RGB LED levels. It's showing also the accelerometer. So right now the accelerometer is pretty close to being centered. When we pick up the board and start uh, moving it, like I'm kind of moving it in the Y direction right now, we can see the accelerometer is picking up on those Y changes. If I change the motion now to moving in the X direction, it's moving left and right. So this is actually detecting the tilt of the board itself um, here, and it can be varied. You'll notice that the, um, depending on, uh, this patch will, will actually run pretty hot, and I'm not sure why the color is changing there. I think it, I think the color goes between uh, green for cool, and then as it gets hotter, this gets more and more orange and possibly red up here. This will actually, given enough time, this patch, uh, I'm not sure exactly why this is, but this will actually make the FPGA run pretty hot. So the temperature here on the FPGA is going to rise. Um, that's just the, na the nature of the patch here. Um, the other thing I've noticed, which is kind of interesting, is, is the RGB LED monitors here, this is a flaw in the demo mode, don't necessarily um, show what the actual RGB things are doing, uh, RGB LEDs are doing. I should say that there are, in addition to the 16 LEDs located above the switches, there are two RGB LEDs located here and here. 
and this button here kind of controls what mode they're in. So if, if you hit the right button, you'll see it'll just it'll just show each button as now being solid blue. Hit it again. Hit the oh that's just the right button. Hit the center button. We get solid green appearing on both LEDs. Hit the left button. We get solid red. Then if we go down to the uh, if we hit the down button, this actually selects one or the other. If you cycle through it, you'll see normally both LEDs are on, then just the right one, then just the left one, then both are off. And if you hit the down button uh, enough times, it'll cycle through that. That Hitting that button is actually not, I'm hitting the button now, and you can see it's not reflected on the, um, the indicators here. So that's, uh, that's actually just the, the way that this FPGA patch is designed. That's not a flaw of the board or anything. Uh, and then finally, this uh, this button up here is rather interesting because what it causes is it causes the uh, 16 LEDs to go into a snaking test mode. So you hit it, you'll see there's a snake kind of comes in, a sequence that comes in here, programming from left to right, and then turning them on from right to left. It just, does, it just does that left to right, right to left, and then that's done. And that runs independently of these other buttons. So you can be, uh, you can be hitting the, um, oh, actually it does interfere with these buttons. Like while that's running, the center button doesn't quite work. Or, oh, that's weird, yeah. The center button actually only works in certain LED modes. So there are limitations to this patch, uh, but I wanted to show it. And this patch should load whenever you turn on the board. It's coming from the flash memory and, uh, and should load within a, within a few seconds. Uh, I would recommend that, that you uh, use this to test your board uh, and send me a confirmation that the, that the demo works correctly. Um, <coughs> Oh, what else? Oh, if you need it, uh, on the CD there will be uh, the bit file associated with the demo program. I can't remember if I have source code for the demo. Uh, I seem to recall that I do. Um, I probably won't have time to go in and fix this little RGB LED thing, but I wanted to mention that the CD will include this um, bit file. Let's first see how to uh, send that bit file out to the device using um, the Xilinx's ISE IDE, which is still loading right now. Um, I should mention that Xilinx's ISE IDE and also Vivado, the Vivado suite, the current version is 2019-11, both run under fine under Windows 7, 8, and 10. Uh, I prefer Windows 7, personally, um, and also certain flavors of Linux, uh, specific flavors. I believe, and, and uh, Xilinx describes this more in more detail, that they favor Ubuntu Linux and Red Hat Linux. Don't quote me on that, but I've had best luck running it under both Red Hat and Ubuntu. Furthermore, since I'm running this on a Mac in an emulated environment, I find that Xilinx ISE only runs under my Windows 7 environment due to issues with the licensing. It doesn't license correctly under Linux under Parallels, so I have to run IXE under Windows. And the reverse is true for <laughs> Xilinx Vivado. Vivado works fine under Ubuntu Linux. It, uh, it fail uh, under Parallels. It doesn't license correctly under Windows. So I have to run one I, well, I have to run one I, IDE in one operating system and the other ID in the other operating system simply because of the restrictions of running in a virtual environment on the Mac. You shouldn't encounter that if you're running on native Windows or Linux. Okay, so what I want to do is I just want to run the manage configuration project tool to select a the device. First thing we need to do is to plug in the device. I have a USB hub sitting right here that plugs into my Mac. When we do this, we'll see the uh, the device recognized by Windows after a bit. And 
and sometimes, yeah, sometimes this doesn't work. Oh, there it goes. It was just taking too long. And of course, now I've turned off the device. Let me turn on the device again, plug it in. It was just a little bit slow to respond. There we go. So the FPGA is on and running the demo mode. Let me plug it in again. This time it was more reasonable recognizing it. So I'm routing that connection to the um, to the Windows system. Now uh, to connect using ISE, we're going to double click on the boundary scan. Um, and then I, I right click here and say initialize chain. You shouldn't see any errors. And now it's asking for where the um, where the patches that you want to load. I happen to have that on my document on my desktop. So I'm going to where the desktop is. There's the bit file. Sorry, I did that rather quickly. It came up in a default location uh, somewhere down here, and I basically went to where my um, I went to where my desktop is located, and here's the bit file. So now it found the bit file, and it finally says. This attaches to Flash. Do you want to attach an SPI or BPI prom to this device? I answer no. And then there's a little thing here, which I've never figured out what this is. I think it's just confirming that it's connected. You say OK. Now we're connected. Now we can actually program the device. When I double click on program, it's sending down the bit file. So this is now the same demo, same exact demo. Now, not having been loaded from Flash, but having been sent down from USB. <coughs> so that shows how to program the device. This patch that happens to come up here is a little uh, hacked thing, which is kind of a nice thing because it tests a full, it looks like it ten, tests about 72% of the fabric on the FPGA, which is quite a bit. And that, um, that we can load. It's called the Wireworld Computer Test. And uh, that I can load by simply going back to the ISE impact and saying, assign new configuration file. And then I go to where my configuration file is located, which will take me a moment to get to. And we see the Wireworld computer. Oh, it's under FPGA tests. Now it's the Wireworld computer test for Nexus 4 um, using the ISC IDE. And we do the same things. We say program. Say OK. Now that patch is shooting down. This patch does not uh, does not load uh, does not produce any video. Uh, it's just simply controlled by the switches here. I'll include this source code because it shows what a kind of a large scale patch might look like. And this uh, with the switches off, this is actually running halted. So um, let's start it again. If I hit the um, CPU reset here, that's resetting my patch to its initial settings. Down here on the LEDs, it's showing something related to clock generation, which is a little hard to explain. And up here, it should show prime numbers starting from three. So if I switch this, we're seeing that it's now generating prime numbers. It's a little hard to see this with the uh, room lights as bright as they are. But uh, like 491, 503, 523, 5, it's going pretty quickly, but it's generating prime numbers up to about 30,000. 30, this is actually running a cellular automaton in here, which is kind of hard to explain. It's doing uh, prime generation very inefficiently, but uh, the nice thing is, is it's testing most of the FPGA fabric. So that's that um, sample program. Now let's start talking about the PMOD connectors. So I'm shipping four PMOD, PMOD devices. I'm shipping four PMOD devices with this unit. Um, the first I won't actually um, use. I'll just explain what it is. The first is a PMOD breakout board uh, that has a breadboarding patch. And if you slide the breadboarding patch up, you, you have some solder uh, sites here so you can um, 
It's got the standard one one tenth inch spacing for uh, dip or breadboard usage, and um, and it had the breadboard has been installed, um, so you'd have to pull it off, which which would uh, which would ruin the double sided sticky tape here to get at the uh, solder points here. Uh, included with this is a female dual uh, P mod connector which connects to two what look like male P mod adapters but they're actually female females with a bit of a header stuck in there so these are actually female adapters with a gender converter uh, stuck in there so you can get to male so basically if you wanted to wire up a project you could uh, put this adapter in, make sure this symbol here is face up, and then attach, for example, the B connector to the bottom of one P mod and the A connector to the top of the same P mod to make it a direct wire through, or you could even, um, you know, attach this to a different thing. The P mods are oriented in such a way as we'll see in the schematic. Oh, let's go to the schematic right now. Again, kind of too bright for the video. Let me see if I can... Yeah, restarting the video, uh, we see this a little bit better. We see that uh, here's the the male connector on the left side. Um, so that's this uh, this connector and this plug here. We see that uh, basically the top pins, the pins go left uh, left to right as you're looking at them pin wise. So the the thing with the symbol is pin one. You have four signal connectors, one, two, three, and four, then you have ground and VCC clearly mounted, uh, clearly marked here. And then in the bottom row, you have another four digital signals, P7, P8, P9, P10, and then another ground and VCC. There are two jumpers uh, which are installed, which simply echo ground and VCC out to this external connector which you can uh, daisy chain other devices from. And then in the middle there is this solder connect solderless breadboard or uh, solder connector array which you can wire in connecting to these two uh, plugs here via jumper. So uh, the the one I've I've never really had occasion to use these except in um, except in teaching circles simply because the breadboard is so small. It's just big enough to attach two DIP-16 uh, ICs, one, two here, or a DIP-14 or DIP-16 with a little circuitry on the bottom, or obviously a DIP-20 or 24 or DIP-28 should fit just fine, um, but it's really too small for any serious use. So that's the, that's the PMOD BB. Then we also have, um, then I'll just very quickly say what the other P mods being shipped are. We have eight LEDs available on this P mod 8 LED, uh, and we'll see a demo of that. We have a P mod OLED, which produces really tiny uh, monochromatic text. This requires that you build a, a state machine uh, and uh, to interface to this properly. Um, there is a demo that will ship on the CD uh, written by Vigilant, and I believe I modified it a bit to make it a little tighter, um, which demonstrates how to use this. And finally, there is a 16 uh, a hexadecimal keypad input, all of the digits from 0 through F. This likewise requires a state machine since these are multiplexed. Um, <laughs> you can look up the way this is wired, but there's basically four. The PMOD, the eight PMOD uh, digital signals are wired uh, one uh, per row and uh, one per column and also one per row. And then you have to multiplex looking for connections while also debouncing, which is very important. So that's actually kind of a very good um, learning project to learn how to um, build this. I'll ship Digilent's code, uh, which uh, which shows how to do that, and um, I'll also show why there's a bug in their code, which is not related to the keypad itself. Keypad's in proper operation, but related to something funny that they're doing. 
<coughs> so let me pause the video while I run, uh, while I load each of those video, oh, each of those demos. We'll start with the PMOD 8 LD. Okay, we're back, and uh, I have this demo, uh, the PMOD 8 LD demo, uh, will ship on the D on the CD both in for uh, Xilinx ISE and also Xilinx of Lovato. Uh, we'll look at it in the in the Lovato uh, version. All it is is a very simple program that cycles a simple patch that uh, sets up a chain uh, where it's just basically cycling a single LED running down through all of the connections, all the PMOD connections, and then through the central, central LEDs, then up and down back here. You can only really see this occurring. Well, first let me show you what it will look like if you just plug in your single um, PMOD 8 LED connector. You can plug it into either of these four PMOD connectors here. It won't work on the, um, on the JX PMOD or JX programming connector here, which is this. This is a different thing. So plug in the PMOD 8LD into any one of these four connectors and then fire up this patch and I'll show you what it'll do. In Vivado, I've already done the Windows stuff. To, uh, the, this is now Ubuntu Linux since I'm running uh, Vivado. Um, I've already done the bit where this is now being recognized. The USB connection is being routed to this operating system here. So down at the bottom, we're going to want to open the hardware manager, and we're going to want to say open target, and then auto connect. And that should go well if the operating system has recognized the, um, the, uh, the driver, uh, the USB driver here. And you should see uh, up here under the hardware panel that appears, you should see localhost, and then it'll identify the board. And down here, it's identifying the um, the FPGA as an XC, XC7A100T, uh, and then over here, we're seeing the XADC system monitor. So that that shows that you're properly connected. And then finally, the bit the bit file for this has already been built. I don't want to deal with you know re re uh, compiling the code. We simply say program device. We select the XC7A100T. That sends the new patch down to the device. Oh, first there's a there is a uh, confirmation that we're lo loading this bit file. We have an enable end of startup check. Just uh, select both of those. Say program. You should then see the uh, the lights flicker, and now we have our um, we have our test running. So here's that running LED. You can see it's kind of going up here coming back down here, running down here, and now it's going up these. And there's one LED that appears to be stuck, and it's actually not stuck. That's simply because with any switch you throw here, it's throwing an equivalent set of LEDs. The operation of this is really obvious what it's doing if we plug in a PMOD 8 LED. If you get some more PMOD 8 LED devices, because you can never have too many LEDs with an FPGA, then you'll see exactly what this patch is doing. It's simply running that single LED on, running up and down here, up and down here. So you can see it's running between, uh, what's 16, what's 8 times 6? I think that's 48. Um, it's running between 48 LEDs, 16 on this side, 16 here, and 16 on this side, just running that single LED here. If we throw any switch, it basically throws the corresponding LED solid on. This is just simply to confirm that all of these uh, PMOD connections are all working, and as I run through all 16 combinations, I'm seeing all of the, my hand is kind of in the way to see this properly, but you can kind of see that all of the connections are working, confirming that the PMOD connectors are all working, the corresponding pins on the FPGA are working, and also the slides, which is working. So this is part of my test um, to confirm that everything's working. Yep, everything uh, is working properly. So that's the PMOD 8LD. Uh, it's a nice little module available for 10 bucks from uh, Xilinx, uh, sorry, from Digilent. 
and um, I got a whole bunch on sale for half, I think it was for either half price or they shipped without shipping. I think I got free shipping on them, so that's when I bought four more. I was very happy about that purchase because you can never have too many LEDs. All right, onward and upward. The next test is going to be of the PMOD OLED. Okay, next up I'm going to show how the PMOD OLED um, um, module works. Um, and I haven't really used it much beyond uh, testing it out. Um, I don't even think there's been a single project where I found need for character output. So that's why I'm selling, selling this. At all my projects, it's been sufficient just to use the LEDs and switches. So I'm including this as a kind of a freebie in the purchase. Um, but I am including two versions of Digilent's uh, test code for this. The original code was uh, configured for the Nexus 3 and won't work on the Nexus 4. I'll include the source files for that in their unmodified state. I made a series of modifications. Uh, for one thing, I used the, uh, if, uh, if you look at the PMOD OLED control Nexus 4 patch that's included on the, um, the CD, uh, the changes are noted. For one thing, I knocked out the Nexus 3 UCF constraint file and substituted the Nexus 4 constraint file uh, to make use of JA on the um, Nexus 4. That's this connector right here. Um, I then also just today made a change, which is actually recompiling right now, where those signals are echoed to JB, JC, and JD. So in other words, it won't matter in this version of the test program which of the four um, PMOD connectors you connect this, this device to. And I prefer to connect this device while the power is off. So let's, uh, let's connect it to the JA connector, which is where it was originally written to connect to, and that way the text will be oriented correctly going up. Another change I made was the original files had individual signal names here for the, the individual SPI control signals. There are seven of them, um, and I thought that was confusing because at this point, at the top level, you just want to see, oh, it connects to the JA connector. You don't want to see what the individual signals are. So that's a cosmetic change there. So you can see right here, there's a mapping from the individual um, signal names to the JA connector, and then, oh, I did this cor incorrectly, didn't I? There's a bug right here that should say JA. Yeah, so here JB, JB is assigned the value of JA, JC is wired to JA, and JD is wired to JA. So these signals here are connected as a bus, a bundle, out to these. Let me recompile now that I made that change. This, uh, incidentally, will not, should not produce any errors, but it will produce a whole lot of warnings owing to latch trimming, one of the many things I don't like about the Xilinx ISE. This, uh, this demo is being shipped in ISE form for a very simple reason. There's a character library RAM module in here that Digilent built that at the time I didn't have time and I probably won't have time before the sale to convert this to Vivado form. So it's simply because of this library here that has the character patterns for the, for the dots associated with each ASCII character. Uh, that's really the only reason why the um, why this project ships in ISC form and not Vivado form. If I had the time, I'd rebuild the demo for Vivado, but since it's just a demo for a module I don't really use, that's kind of a bit of a waste of time. So this is, uh, this is being shipped in ISC form. So it's be doing the place and route right now, but we're ready to at least turn on the FPGA and get it ready. So this is now booting into the uh, the Nexus 4 demo. Now I'm plugging this in so we can do the USB connection here. I'm not seeing anything in a curse. I'm assuming that's working correctly. It's, it was basically already connected. And uh, yeah, there's a few join issues here. There, uh, ISC complains a lot, and it, it's uh, it's it's sometimes hard to spot 
serious issues from less serious issues, but especially for these demos, I've learned to kind of ignore the warnings. Now it's generating the program file, so we're almost there. Uh, let me go ahead and get ready to select the programming file. That is in Digilent. Sorry, no, it's in FPGA IP LEDs. I have multiple versions of this, and there's a wrong version somewhere, so I'm trying to get to the right version. So we're looking for PMOD OLED Nexus 4 ISC. You can see I have different versions so that it will run on um, other FPGA boards that I that I own. And the generating generate programming file uh, flag is done, so we can select that file and not attach flash. Select the FPGA, program it, and this should send the patch down now. This also doesn't produce any video. And this work, this was working correctly. It, it happens pretty quickly. Let me uh, let me hit the uh, CPU reset button, the left reset button here, and you'll see what this does. And unfortunately, it's out of focus on the video. I don't think there's any way I can trigger a refocus in video mode. Yeah, I can't. Um, crappy camera. But basically, if you were to if you were to um, get up really close to this, you would see that it is um, correctly showing the, um, the characters. It'll first show, when you hit that reset, it'll first show all the characters it's generating. Then it'll produce a little text that says, this is Digilance PMOD OLED. And that's all the, uh, that's all the program does. Every time you, uh, I don't think any of the buttons or the switches do anything. Every time you reset it, it just runs again. So it runs here. And I think, oh, I changed it. Uh, yeah, another modification I made, I forgot to document this, is it makes use of the, um, of the RGB LEDs. I should add this to the documentation um, so that basically you'll see when it's in resetting the device, programming it, it goes quickly between red, green, and finally blue modes when it's in the wait state. So it's, and then finally off when the program has completed and it's just now idle. So um, basically red means it's in the reset state. It's, it's, uh, it's reprogram there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain timing thing that you have to do when you're first setting up, configuring the OLED. And then it does a very quick, uh, uh, I think it goes green while it's sending data and so on. So the, the output LEDs here show, uh, show what it's doing. And it happens very quickly. It goes red, green, blue very, very quickly. So you should see it mostly in the blue state and then finally off when the test is done. So that was another modification I made to this test just so I could see more what was going on. And that's the whole thing. That's the PMOD 8 LED. Next and final uh, test will be the uh, will be the PMOD, PMOD hex keypad test. Okay, the final PMOD that I'll be demonstrating is this PMOD keypad, uh, hex keypad. This is actually something I bought, ran the demo, modified the demo, and then like many things, PMOD things that I've bought, I've basically found zero use for it. Um, I tend to be very happy just running off of the seven segment display, the switches, the buttons, and the LEDs. So that's enough uh, in user interface for me. Uh, this requires that you build a small state machine and do some stuff with deep, uh, debouncing uh, of the uh, buttons and also properly happening what occurs if the user uh, turn, you know, presses more than one button at a time, which this patch that I'm going to show you does not do. So I'm going to include on the CD-ROM both the original, I think it was built for a Nexus 3, the original digital link code and also my modified Nexus 4 code. It was originally written by Michelle Yu at Digilent, modified in VHDL, modified by Josh Sackis, who converted it to Verilog, and then I've done some changes to um, make it work on the Nexus 4, including the constraints file change, uh, noting that it's running on I selected uh, port JB, um, and it says which pins, uh, it's doing some multiplexing. Uh, four of the JB pins are used 
to fire out signals. Uh, those are in-outs, the way they're defined. Um, it's interesting the way I defined, the way it's written. Um, the, the pins are defined as in-out pins, which is rather interesting, rather than four outputs and four inputs. So that's kind of an interesting thing to be aware of in the way this works. Um, let's go ahead and fire this up. I believe I've already loaded it into the impact. This is another thing that was done a long time ago, so it's only available in ISC form. I haven't converted. You can experiment with just importing this into Vivado. It should import just fine. There's no funny library stuff going on, so there should be any, uh, uh, any issues there. And, uh, oh, yes, let me first turn on the device. The, uh, the uh, Nexus 4 demo should load some flash. Let me plug in the USB connector, which should connect to parallels. Let me make sure everything is connected properly. And then program the device. Let's see if this works correctly. Yes, it's programming the device. This doesn't produce any video. Uh, what it does do, though, is it'll come up with a zero. And then as you press keys, it, the, the key should uh, update on this one LED. So if I press 1, I see 1, 2, 3, 4 is over here, 4, 5, 6. Oh, it's also showing the, um, let me see if I can get the camera seeing all of this. So let's start that over. 0, 1, you'll see the, the binary equivalent of the, the, the hexa value on these four LEDs here. 2, 3, uh, that's A, sorry, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, now A is up here, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and back to 0. If we reset this, it's just basically, uh, let's see what happens if I reset it while it's set to 6. Oh, it looks like there is no reset in this program. None of the buttons do anything. The switches don't do anything. So it's really just a very simple test. It's just looking for the keypad here. Now here's what I was talking about, about there being a bug. It does work quite well in terms of, as far as I can tell, it's, tell it's, uh, it's properly debouncing, although that would actually be hard to tell. Um, what it's not doing is, for example, if I press 7 and D at the same time, or was it 4 and D at the same time? Yeah, if I press 4 and D at the same time, it's actually flipping between detecting 4 and D. You see this weird LED pattern and both 4 and D. This also happens between 7 and D. So this, or is it, I forget. There's certain combinations. Here's another one, 8 and D. There's certain combinations and it has to do with, it seems to be when you pick um, two buttons that are in different rows. Like if I pick this button and this button, it reads this as 8. If I, if I pick 8 and C together, it detects it as 8. If I pick 8 and F together, it detects it as 8. F, if I hit F first, it's detecting this. And then 8, it's detecting this as 8. But if you pick two buttons that are in different columns and rows, then you get weird behavior. So it looks like actually if I select four buttons along a diagonal, that's kind of a worse case. If I pick D9 and 5, I believe, yeah, see what it looks like it's doing is it looks like it's shifting between the 5 and the 9 and not recognizing the D at all. So this is a suboptimal, it's actually kind of tricky to write these things properly. So this is a good, uh, a good example of do's and don'ts. It's good to confirm that the, the keypad hardware itself is properly working, and that's the real purpose of this demo. But if you hit more than one button at a time and you see weird things occurring, that has to do with the patch and the way that it's uh, decoding the presses. That's a function not of the hardware doing anything incorrect. That's a function of somewhat loose uh, FPGA design. Another thing I should mention, uh, let me see if I can show an example here, is you'll notice there's a very distinct difference between code that I wrote from this period and code that I'm writing today. Like in this period, I kind of realized it was kind of a good idea to add explicit output buffers 
Um, these, these come in, input buffers and output buffers on I.O. pins, that kind of happens automatically in both, um, in both ISC and Vivado, but I believe Vivado at times can give you warnings if you don't put in explicit output buffers. So that's something that I started doing. Another thing I started paying attention to in the last couple of years is proper synchronization of not just clock signals, but data signals when they cross clock boundaries. And that actually plays a role when you're dealing with just reading switches and buttons here. With buttons, you have the, the issue <coughs> of debouncing, proper debouncing. That's always important. But you also have the issue of dealing with the fact that you're coming from a rather asynchronous domain into a clocked synchronous domain. And I'll show you what the solution is. It's really simple, but it's a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. This is one of the many things that you learn as you go and get up to speed on um, FPGA design and coding. Um, there are all kinds of subtle issues that will, cro will crop up. I won't say might crop up, but will crop up if you don't pay attention to these things. So let me, let me see if I do this correctly here. Yeah, uh, here's a good example. In this, um, in this example program, which is Prime Generator Test Nexus 4, and this is, an, this, only, uh, this is the ISC version. I believe there's a Vivado version as well. You'll see there's a very common thing that I'm now doing in my code. We have a whole bunch of inputs and a whole bunch of outputs defined. We have a uh, set of parameters here. Then we have in the implementation section, we have input and output buffering occurring. So here I'm using a macro of my own to define six input buffers on these six input pins, reset, button up, button left, button center, button right, button down, and those now have internal signal names. I'm also buffering the switch input, so this is in inserting 16 input buffers here on the input switches, but the really important code relating to crosses, crossing um, clock domains is this bit here where it's synchronizing the input signals to the clock. So I have um, basically a shift register bank. It's two signals wide and two shifts deep, which is basically accepting the asynchronous signals here and generating output signals here reset and fast. So there's a bit of combinatorial logic that's sitting on the asynchronous side, which is fine because it's not clocked yet at this point. And then at this point, this is now considered a synchronous signal synchronized to the clock. And it's very important that you do this kind of stuff because if you don't, I noticed a whole bunch of my patches didn't respond to the buttons quite correctly. Like it would work like like 30 or 40 times you'd hit the buttons and everything would work correctly, and then you'd hit the button and something weird would happen. And I could never figure out what the weird thing was until I read up on synchronization. By adding these synchronization, you can, you can, it's a low probability coming from the asynchronous world, but there is a certain probability that a, a signal coming in um, is improperly synchronized and metastable, and that can end up with all kinds of weird glitches occurring. So this little bit here, which is eating up four flip-flops, it is really important to prevent that kind of error. And then this is actually a pretty big patch, which is generating three uh, U-risk cores to generate prime numbers. In fact, let's run this since, it, since this is included in the uh, CD, and let's see that it's working. So let me assign a new configuration file get to where this uh, file is, which is located in my mathematics hierarchy and not in my FPGA hierarchy, oddly enough. So this is under mathematics, so automata, wire world, FPGA, tests, prime generator, test, nexus for Verilog ISC. That sounds correctly. There's the bit file. And let me send the bit file to the device. What this does, if the switches are off, no, it hasn't sent the patch yet. There goes the patch. Is this just starts generating 
It's a 32-bit CPU that's generating uh, prime numbers. It's hard to see the LEDs with the which it, with as bright the LED, the lights are for this video. But if you um, this is running at full tilt with the three little URIS cores being clocked at 100 megahertz. So you can see it's generating prime numbers pretty quickly, although there's something that's kind of suboptimal occurring. And then um, if I flip any of the switches, it's now generating, um, if I hit any of the switches or hit any of the buttons, this is now generating um, with a clock of probably more like uh, 30 clocks per second or somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, probably the uh, Probably the code itself, oh, unfortunately it doesn't document, it's basically dividing the signal by whatever 100 megahertz divided by 2 to the 22nd power is, that's the frequency of this uh, slower clock when I flip in a switch. Otherwise it's running at a full 100 um, megahertz. But in any case what the patch is doing is, is it's running a whole lot slower. When you throw this, uh, when you throw this switch, you can actually see the address bus and what's what's occurring. Otherwise, at full tilt, uh, it's too uh, too fast to distinguish what's going on. In any case, that should basically confirm that the Xilinx. We haven't seen any device issues here, other than I mentioned there are sl occasional uh, issues w uh, with the slide switches here. Uh, that's always occurred with this device, but other than that, it's in perfect working order. So hopefully this video properly documents the level of testing uh, that was done on the device and gives you a good start as to what's on the CDR included with the device and some tips and places to go. And the sale includes three hours of uh, email or Facebook technical support. Um, so if there's any questions you have down the uh, after the sale, up to two years after the sale, I'd be glad to help you out. I know it's, uh, there's a significant learning curve associated with these, bo with these boards. That's everything, and uh, I hope uh, whoever buys this uh, board enjoys it very much. It's provided what? Uh, when did I? It's provided five years of good service for me, and I'm happy to pass it along in working condition to the next owner. This is Blind Man Burt signing off.